Chapter 4. Johnson. There could hardly have been a greater contrast than that between the slight, young Francis Barber, then probably aged about 10, and Samuel Johnson. At this stage in his life, the 42-year-old writer looked like a boxer who was past his prime. Portraits of him in later life show him as rather portly, but when Barber met him he was tall and muscular though ungainly, and towered over most people. He is upwards of six feet wrote Boswell's friend, the Reverend William Johnson Temple, and proportionably large and gross, big-boned, clumsy and awkward. You would rather take him for an Irish chairman, London porter, or one of Swift's probing nudgeons, than for a man of letters. Even a man of letters had to walk the threatening streets of London, and Johnson's uncommon size and strength had on occasion saved his purse, and possibly his life. Once, while walking in a darkened street, he was attacked by four robbers but fought them off single-handedly until the watch could be summoned. On another occasion Johnson encountered two large dogs, fighting ferociously. Boswell recounted that as one who would separate two little boys who were foolishly hurting each other, he ran up to them, and cuffed their heads till he drove them asunder. What he possessed in the way of strength, however, he lacked in the way of control over his body. This was not just a matter of clumsiness or awkwardness, but something much more serious and perhaps neurological in origin, it has been suggested that he may have suffered from Tourette's syndrome. As he made his way along the street, his lurching movements attracted attention and mockery. Lady Sia Matilda Hawkins, daughter of Johnson's biographer, John Hawkins, recalled that he made his way up Bolt Court in the zigzag direction of a flash of lightning, submitting his course only to the deflections imposed by the impossibility of going further to right or left. He always walked with his left arm folded across his chest, and his left hand under his chin, thrusting his legs out to the side in a motion memorably captured by Boswell, when he walked, it was like the struggling gait of one in fetters. Even when he was at ease, he was not still. His mouth is in perpetual motion, as if he was chewing, wrote the novelist Francis Burney. He has a strange method of frequently twirling his fingers, and twisting his hands, his body is in continual agitation, seesawing up and down, his feet are never a moment quiet, in short, his whole person is in perpetual motion. On more than one occasion people meeting Johnson for the first time had serious doubts about his sanity. Boswell reported that when the artist William Hogarth was visiting Samuel Richardson, he perceived a person standing at a window in the room, shaking his head, and rolling himself about in a strange ridiculous manner. He concluded that he was an idiot, whom his relations had put under the care of Mr. Richardson, as a very good man. That person was Johnson. The painter Osius Humphrey, observing Johnson for the first time, recorded that I could hardly help thinking him a madman for some time, as he sat waving over his breakfast like a lunatic. Nor did Johnson improve on closer inspection, as numerous accounts over the years indicated. His appearance was very forbidding, wrote Boswell, describing him as a young man in 1734, he was then lean and lank, so that his immense structure of bones was hideously striking to the eye, and the scars of the scrapula were deeply visible. When Boswell met Johnson for the first time in May 1763 he wrote that Mr. Johnson is a man of a most dreadful appearance. Francis Burney recorded in 1778 that this man has a face the most ugly, a person the most awkward, and manners the most singular, that ever were, or ever can be seen. To add to the disconcerting effect of his appearance, he had, according to Joshua Reynolds's sister Frances, a loud and imperious voice which had an intimidating influence on those who were not much acquainted with him. This was the startling figure Francis Barber first encountered at 17 Gough Square. It was not a meeting calculated to set a ten-year-old at ease. If the person Barber met was alarming, the atmosphere of his home in Gough Square was one of deep gloom. Only a few years earlier, when Johnson had taken possession of the house, it had seemed to mark a great upturn in his fortunes, a leap forward after many years of struggle, but now his affairs, both professional and personal, were at a very low ebb. The path to Gough Square had been a long one, and mostly uphill. Samuel Johnson was born in 1709 in Lichfield, Staffordshire, the eldest son of a bookseller and his wife, who had married late in life. From very early on, and in spite of his disabilities, he was recognized as a prodigy who in some way would make his mark in the world. He was gifted with a remarkable memory, devouring the many books which formed his father's stock. When he entered Pembroke College in October 1728, an Oxford degree was within his grasp as the first step on his road to distinction. It was many years before he took the second step. The chance he had been given was snatched away from him when he was forced to leave Oxford without a degree after thirteen months, 
as his father could no longer afford to pay the fees. He had no choice but to return to Litchfield, the local boy who had not made good. There, at the age of about 20, he suffered a serious nervous collapse, the first of a number of such episodes which occurred throughout his life. For a time he worked, with a conspicuous lack of enthusiasm, in his father's bookshop, but he then determined on becoming a schoolmaster. It was an ambition which he pursued tenaciously, though his regard for some of his own teachers had been low, education was something which he valued very highly, a fact which was to stand Barber in good stead. Over the next seven years he applied for six posts, two applications resulted in work which lasted only a few months, and the others were met with rejections. His lack of a degree was a significant obstacle, but so was his appearance. One application was turned down because he was a very haughty, ill-natured gent and had a way of distorting his face. His failure was compounded with loss when, a year after he left Oxford, his father died. His recovery came from an unexpected direction. In 1735 he married Elizabeth Porter, the widow of a mercer in Birmingham, she was twenty years Johnson's senior, and the mother of three children. The match provided Johnson with vital emotional support, but it was bitterly opposed by her family. Johnson was several notches down the social scale and was impecunious, with no obvious way of supporting a wife. Elizabeth Porter did have money, however, and Johnson used it to set up a school near Litchfield. Like all his previous ventures into education it failed, and he determined instead to make his living as a writer. In 1737 he traveled to London with a half-finished play, Irene, in his pocket. From then until 1762, when he received a royal pension, he lived precariously by his pen in any way that he could. The work poured out, essays, reviews, biographies, translations, political tracts, sermons, poems, and accounts of the proceedings in Parliament, anything which might make money. Johnson was, however, no mere Grub Street hack. His poems London, 1738, and the Vanity of Human Wishes, 1749, attracted notice, not least, from Alexander Pope, and an account of the life of Mr. Richard Savage, 1744, created a new kind of biography, telling the story of his friend, the poet, wastrel, and killer Richard Savage in a way that was both deeply sympathetic and unillusioned. Gradually Johnson acquired a reputation, at least in the small world of London editors, booksellers, and publishers. Beyond that circle, however, he had made little impact. In 1746 his old Litchfield mentor Gilbert Walmsley described him as a great genius, quite lost both to himself and the world. Nor did increasing professional recognition bring with it much in the way of tangible benefits, Johnson remained poor. Then on June 18, 1746, everything changed for Johnson. On that date he met over breakfast with a consortium of booksellers and signed a contract to write a dictionary of the English language. It was a massive undertaking for one man, and the fact that the booksellers were willing to entrust it to Johnson is an indication of the regard they had for his abilities. The payment agreed was £1,575, payable in installments as the work progressed. For the first time in his life Johnson had a guaranteed income. He was confident that it would take him three years to write the book, at which rate he would earn, on average, £10 per week. Admittedly, he would have to pay all his expenses from this income including his clerks, whose wages cost him 23s per week, but this would still have left him a handsome sum. Since his arrival in London, Johnson had moved from one set of lodgings to another in the courts and alleys around the Strand and Fleet Street, anywhere that was cheap. He now took a lease on the house in Gough Square, paying rent of about £26 a year. It was a place of work for him and his assistants, and a home for Johnson and his wife Elizabeth, whom he usually called Teddy. Johnson's relationship with Teddy had not always been an easy one, and they had spent some time apart, but the dictionary contract promised a new start, with financial stability and a comfortable home. They moved into the house and set up the garret as Johnson's place of work. In spite of Johnson's newfound security, however, the work did not proceed well. It took much longer than he had estimated, and early in 1750 he realized with horror that he had made a false start and that his methodology would need to be fundamentally revised. The discovery was devastating, coming as it did over three years into the work. Publication would be further delayed, and the booksellers started to make anxious inquiries about their investment. Johnson responded angrily to their request for a meeting, I shall not see the gentlemen partners till the first volume is in the press. On several occasions he had to borrow money to pay debts as they fell due. Then, on March 17, 1752, came the heaviest blow of all. Teddy died. Her death, 
the end of their 16-year marriage, plunged Johnson into distress. Throughout his life he had suffered from a strong depressive tendency, which he described to Boswell as a vile melancholy which made him mad all his life, at least not sober. The loss of his wife triggered black moods of despair and self-reproach. This was another failure to add to all the others. He became an isolated figure, avoiding his friends. When he felt the pressure of time become insupportable, wrote William Shaw, the only expedient he had was to walk the streets of London. This for many a lonesome night was his constant substitute for sleep. More than two years later, Johnson wrote that ever since Teddy's death he had seemed to himself a kind of solitary wanderer in the wild of life. A gloomy gazer on a world to which I have little relation. This was the unpromising background to Francis Barber's arrival at Gough Square. It was early April 1752 when Barber arrived at Johnson's home. In her Anecdotes of the Late Samuel Johnson, LL.D., published in 1786, Hester Thrill Piazzi stated that when Teddy Johnson died, Francis Barber ran in the middle of the night to fetch Johnson's friend the Reverend John Taylor. But Piazzi was mistaken, as Barber had not at that date joined the household. Boswell asked Barber about this story and recorded that Mrs. Johnson was dead a fourth night or three weeks before, Barber, came to the doctor. What prompted Dr. Bathurst to suggest that Barber might become part of Johnson's household? He was certainly aware that Johnson would willingly agree to such a proposal, as he was well known for his charity to those in need. He loved the poor as I never yet saw anyone else do, with an earnest desire to make them happy, recalled Mrs. Piazzi. Barber had needs, and neither of the Bathursts, father or son, was in a strong financial position to supply them. Another motive was suggested by John Hawkins in his life of Samuel Johnson, where he wrote that Johnson's earnings at this time had exalted him to such a state of comparative affluence, as, in his judgment, made a manservant necessary. It is an improbable scenario, the habitually slovenly Johnson regarding a manservant as a necessity. Johnson's recurrent financial difficulties had certainly eased, at least for a while, on the day before Teddy died he sent a draft for £100 towards paying off the mortgage on his mother's house in Lichfield. He had probably raised the money by selling the rights to the series of Rambler essays which he had published between March 1750 and March 1752, but Hawkins was mistaken about the general extent of Johnson's affluence, wrongly imagining that he had earnings from other work. However, there was more to the situation than Johnson's benevolence, real though that was. The fact that Teddy's death and Barber's arrival occurred so close together suggests that they were linked. Dr. Bathurst could not have failed to be aware of the depth of Johnson's misery, perhaps he calculated that Johnson might be stirred from his depression by the company of a young boy in his cheerless household. Whatever the reason, it was an astute move on Bathurst's part and showed a perceptive understanding of Johnson's character. There were many Johnsons, and in some guises, as moralist, satirist, and controversialist, Johnson was capable of high seriousness. But those who knew him best recognized that he also had a certain childlike quality. In spite of, or perhaps because of, his general awkwardness and lack of coordination, there was an intense physicality about him, of a kind which appeals to children. There are many stories of him walking great distances, running races, climbing trees, jumping fences, and rolling down hills, even into old age. It was an aspect which was highlighted in some recollections published in the European magazine in 1798. It is a well-known fact that, Johnson, would frequently descend from the contemplation of subjects the most profound imaginable to the most childish playfulness. It was no uncommon thing to see him hop, step, and jump, he would often seat himself on the back of his chair, and more than once has been known to propose a race on some grass plat adapted to the purpose. It is a striking fact about Johnson that many of his friends in his middle and later years were much younger than himself, James Boswell, Hester Thrale, Bennett Langton, and Topham Beauclerk were all some thirty years younger, and his great friend Francis Burney was more than forty years younger. He also had a genuine liking for children, enjoyed their company, and could be playful and entertaining. Francis Burney wrote that Dr. Johnson has more fun and comical humor, and laughable and nonsense about him, than almost anybody I ever saw. No one was in a better position to observe Johnson's response to children than Hester Thrale. Over the course of her marriage to the Brewer and Member of Parliament Henry Thrale, she gave birth to twelve children, only four of whom survived into adulthood. Johnson took a great interest in them, and visited them at school. He wrote affectionate letters to the eldest daughter, Hester Maria, Queenie, Thrale, writing to her for the first time when she was seven years old. My sweet, dear, pretty, little miss. Please to tell little mama, that I am glad to hear, 
that she is well, and that I am going to Lichfield, and shall come soon to London. Desire her to make haste and be quite well, for, you know, that you and I are to tie her to the tree, but we will not do it while she is weak. Tell Harry, her younger brother, that you have got my heart, and will keep it, and that I am, dearest miss, your most obedient servant. Mrs. Thrill recorded that Mr. Johnson was himself exceedingly disposed to the general indulgence of children, and was even scrupulously and ceremoniously attentive not to offend them. For Barbara Place in Johnson's Gough Square household had much to offer, in a city where many children lived and died on the streets, Johnson provided him with a home and an occupation. But it would be wrong to see Barbara as the sole beneficiary of the arrangement, the solitary childless widower would find much to enjoy in the company of his young servant. There was perhaps another aspect of Johnson's life which aroused his sympathies towards the young barber. Johnson's strange looks and manner were often the subject of ridicule, and the terms of such comments are revealing of how he was perceived, he was monstrous, barbarous, a savage. This was exactly the language used by many travel writers at the time to characterize the inhabitants of countries which were not civilized, particularly people of African origins, such as Barber. On some occasions the comparison was expressly made. In 1779 one critic wrote, No man has ever yet seen Dr. Johnson in the act of feeding, or beheld the inside of his cell in Fleet Street, but would think the feasts of Esquimo or the cottages of Hottentots injured by a comparison. It would be ridiculous to suggest that Johnson's journey from Lichfield to London was comparable with Barber's voyage from Jamaica. But there was a sense in which Johnson was treated as an exotic oddity because of his appearance, and this was an experience he shared with Francis Barber. Any such sympathy was not a one-sided affair. In Barber's first days and weeks in Gough Square Johnson was overwhelmed by his recent loss, and his sufferings did not go unnoticed by his young attendant. Their relationship might be that of master and servant, but Barber, in spite of his youth, was capable of recognizing and sympathizing with Johnson's distress. Many years later he recalled that at this time his master had been in great affliction. As a domestic servant Barber was well placed to notice his master's moods. Living in the same house, he attended upon Johnson at all times, whenever called upon to do so, observing him at work, in the company of visitors, and in his dealings with Barber's fellow residents. As we shall see, this last was no straightforward matter. Barber's new home was a substantial house which had been built in 1700 by a wool merchant, Sir Richard Gough. Each of the four floors had just two rooms on either side of a steeply winding staircase, up and down which Francis had to run to carry out his duties. At the very top of the house was the garret, running the full width of the building, the largest room in the house and the one with the best light. In most such houses this space would have been the servants' quarters, or perhaps a nursery. But here it served a different purpose, it was the workroom where Johnson had been laboring on his dictionary for six years by the time Barber joined the household. It was equipped with high desks which could be worked at while standing up, so that Boswell described it as fitted up like a counting house. There was other furniture too all in some disorder. Visitors commented on the books, all covered with dust, an old deal writing desk, and a chair with only three legs. The garret room was not only a place of work for Johnson, but also a place of refuge. Every other room had strong associations with his wife, especially the bedroom where she had died, but not the garret. When asked why he did not use any other room for study, he replied, because in that room only I never saw Mrs. Johnson. Johnson did not work there alone. Barber soon became used to the presence of the small team of clerks who assisted Johnson, or, to use Barber's phrase as recorded by Boswell, wrote to him. They had various roles, one of which was to act as amanuenses. From a vast range of books Johnson would select quotations which illustrated the use of a particular word, and would mark them for an amanuensis to copy out onto a slip of paper. This was no mean task as when the dictionary finally appeared in 1755, it contained 113,000 such quotations, these copyists assisted in other ways as well, some providing administrative help in dealing with the printers and booksellers, and some making minor decisions about the content of the dictionary. They seemed to have been as much friends as they were employees, and several of them continued to drop in to see Johnson from time to time, even after they had ceased to work on the project. Barber gave to Boswell in 1786 an impression of the busy garret at this time. The younger McBean brother of the Duke of Argyle's librarian and Mr. Peyton a linguist who taught foreigners. Then wrote to him, Johnson. The elder McBean and Mr. Maitland, Mr. Stewart and Mr. Shields who had all written to him before used to come about him. 
The whole group was typical of many who formed part of Johnson's shifting household, they were dependent upon Johnson, and he in turn regarded them as his responsibility and did all he could for them. Alexander McBean, his brother William McBean, V. J. Payton, Maitland, Francis Stewart, and Robert Shields were all men who had some kind of connection with the world of print, Stewart was the son of a bookseller, Shields had been a journeyman printer and was an author, and Alexander McBean had assisted Ephraim Chambers with work on his cyclopedia. All eked out a living on the fringes of Grub Street by working on various literary projects. They probably did not all work for Johnson at the same time while Barbara was living there, in fact, two of them, Peyton and William McBean, were probably hired to replace Stewart and Shields after their deaths. One of Barber's early tasks was to take money to the struggling Shields, who died of consumption in December 1753. It meant that from the very beginning of their relationship the young boy recognized Johnson's readiness to help those in need, in spite of the fact that he was far from well off himself. Barber told Boswell, though the doctor had then little to himself Francis frequently carried money from him to Shields when in distress. Over twenty years later, Johnson was still looking out for his associates. When Peyton fell ill in 1775, Johnson wrote to ask a friend for money, I have an old amanuensis in great distress. I have given what I think I can give, and begged till I cannot tell where to beg again. It was a pattern in Johnson's life which Barber was to see over and over again, and from which he too was to benefit. The garret was awash with paper in one form or another, books being consulted, notes being made, and slips on which quotations were written. Paper was expensive and not to be wasted, and Johnson accumulated large quantities of scrap for reuse at a later date. It is to this cluttered workshop that we owe the survival of a remarkable glimpse of Barber's early life in Gough Square, a clue which lay buried for almost two hundred years. While Johnson and his assistants were toiling away, Francis Barber was present as well, and he too was writing. What he wrote could easily have been lost, but it survived amongst the mass of other materials because of the enormous interest generated in Johnson's manuscripts after his death in 1784. When Johnson's library was sold at auction in 1785, the sale catalogue included the enigmatically described 13, of Dr. Johnson's dictionary, with MSS. Notes. What this actually consisted of was some printed parts from the first edition of Johnson's dictionary, with 1,842 interleaved papers on which notes had been written by the amanuenses. The papers passed through the hands of various collectors and dealers until they were eventually presented to Yale University in 1973. But the significance of these materials for the life of Francis Barber was not recognized until the Johnson scholar Alan Reddick carried out work on them, the results of which were published in 1990.31 What Reddick discovered, bound into the volumes, were several slips of paper on which Francis Barber had practiced his handwriting. The paper had been preserved because the other side had been used for writing new material for the fourth edition, 1773, of Johnson's Dictionary. Some of the writing consists of repeated letters, and some is complete words. On one slip of paper appears Antigue, Anne, while on another appear the words England England. They offer tiny windows into the mind of a small boy, about twelve years old, sitting in a Gough Square garret in the 1750s. Something is making him think of the West Indies, and also of the country which is now, for better or worse, his home. But the most evocative of all the slips is the one on which is written Francis Barber, Francis Barber. Like many young children who learn to write, he is practicing writing his own name. Anyone who has handled an old manuscript, especially when it is of historic importance, knows the powerful sense of being in touch with the past. To view that scrap of paper nowadays in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale is, in however small a way, to make contact over the gap of 250 years with a young child, struggling to come to terms with a new identity, a new home, and an unknown future. This writing obviously demonstrates that Barber was by this point literate. It is a striking fact that, at a time when about 40% of adult males in Britain were literate in the sense that they were unable to sign their own name, this young servant and former slave was learning to read and write. He owed this ability, of course, to the education he received, and to those who paid for it. There were several stages to Barber's somewhat irregular schooling. Many a master would have thought that the two years at the school in Barden was quite enough for a servant. It was common for boys to receive nothing more than an elementary education from their mothers or perhaps at a dame school run by a widow or spinster who earned a few pennies each week by teaching the alphabet and basic writing skills. But Johnson had a profound belief in the value of education, derived from his own experience, and was determined to do better than that for Barber. Those who communicate literature to the son of a poor man, 
he wrote, consider him as one not born to poverty, but to the necessity of deriving a better fortune from himself. It had been Johnson's good fortune to be born and brought up in Litchfield, which boasted a famous grammar school. As a local boy Johnson was entitled to free education there, but the reputation of the school was such that day students and boarders came from much farther away, in spite of the fact that such non-locals had to pay fees. Their parents thought it worth the money to obtain a Litchfield school education. Judging by the results, they were right, as the school had a level of success out of all proportion to its size, producing not only Samuel Johnson and the great actor and theater manager David Garrick, but also writers, bishops, and scientists. At one time no fewer than five of the judges sitting in Westminster Hall had been educated at the school. But how was Johnson, living in some penury in the heart of London, to provide an education for Barber? Fortunately, it turned out that the answer was almost on his doorstep. Almost forty years earlier a merchant named Peter Joy had established a charity school in Blackfriars, intended for the poor children of the parishes of St. Anne, Blackfriars, and St. Andrew by the wardrobe. These parishes lay just to the south of Ludgate Hill, and the school itself was in church entry, a very short walk from Johnson's home in Gough Square, the school provided a sound basic education for forty boys and thirty girls. The boys were to be taught to read English, to write and to cast accounts and also, if the trustees think fit, to learn some useful work or employment. The boys were usually between six and twelve years old, and most of them went into some form of domestic service after leaving the school. Not only was the school nearby, but it had another advantage for a child such as Barber. Peter Joy was of Dutch descent, and the school's admissions policy was that preference should be given to the children of foreigners or of foreign extraction. Barber was certainly poor, and was the child of foreigners. The only difficulty was that the school gave priority first to children who were resident in the parish of St. Anne or St. Andrew, and then to those living in neighboring parishes. Johnson's house in Gough Square was in the parish of St. Dunstan in the west. It seems that the solution which Johnson found to the problem was that Barber should board near the school. Barber told Boswell that the doctor first put him to board at Mrs. Coxeter's that he might go to Blackfriars School. The identity of Mrs. Coxeter is not certainly established, but there is a Coxeter family which was closely connected to St. Anne, Blackfriars. The parish records show that three children of Thomas and Elizabeth Coxeter were baptized there in 1739, 1741, and 1744, respectively. There may be some link to the family of Johnson's friend, the literary scholar Thomas Coxeter, who died in 1747, leaving a daughter and a son with little money. Johnson assisted the family from time to time. The plan promised to work well for all concerned, providing an education for Barber, and some income for Mrs. Coxeter. But it came to nothing, after only one day at the school Barber fell ill, and smallpox was diagnosed. There could hardly have been a worse outcome for Johnson's careful planning. Smallpox was rampant in London at the time and was the cause of almost 10% of the deaths in the city. To many who survived, it brought disfigurement and blindness. Just the previous year Johnson had devoted two issues of his Rambler essays to the story of how Victoria, a beautiful young woman, comes to terms with being robbed of her looks by smallpox. Barber was one of the lucky ones, he recovered but, like many others, carried the scars on his face for the rest of his life. When Barber was well again, he stayed with Johnson for a while until Johnson once more turned his thoughts to Barber's schooling. This time he decided against Blackfriars School following the disastrous experience there. Instead, he sent him to be taught by Jacob de Moulin, pronounced de Mullins, a 28-year-old writing master. De Moulin had very recently acquired a connection with Johnson. In May 1752 he married Elizabeth Swinfin, who was the daughter of Johnson's godfather and had been a friend of Johnson's wife in the 1740s. Jacob and Elizabeth had set up their home in Orange Court, Castle Street, Leicester Fields, within walking distance of Gough Square, and it was there that Barber continued his schooling. How long Barber continued with de Moulin is not known, but at some point that stage of his education came to an end, and he took up his role as Johnson's household servant.